Welcome everyone and thank you for being here with us today. Uh, my name is Rebecca Dorr. I'm a senior research associate here at the Crane Center for Early Childhood Research and Policy. Um, for those of you who are new to Crane, the Crane Center is a multidisciplinary center dedicated to improving children's well-being through research, practice, and policy. And we're excited to bring you this research workshop today in collaboration with the Center on Education and Training for Employment, or SEAT. SEAT is a translational research center that bridges research and practice through workforce development, education, and community engagement. Um, a few practical housekeeping items before we get started here today. Uh, we do have live captioning available. You can turn this on using the CC or live captioning button on your Zoom window. Uh, please use the Q&A box to submit questions to the presenters at any time during the presentation. Our team will be monitoring that uh, chat box and we'll also put housekeeping items there. So I'm excited to introduce our two expert speakers today. Dr. Mitsu Narui from the direct, is, is the Director of Research at the Crane Center and a critical race educator. On a personal note, Dr. Narui is a second generation Japanese American and first generation college student. Prior to starting at the Crane Center, Dr. Narui's career had largely been in higher education, having worked in assessment, curricular development, multicultural affairs, government policy, academic advising, and residence life. In addition, she currently serves as the editorial, on the editorial board for the Journal of LGBT Youth and has served on the board for the Journal of Diversity and Higher Education. Finally, she's been actively presenting her research on Asian and Asian American, lesbian, gay, and bisexual college students. She's been published in the Journal of Homosexuality, as well as presented her research at the Association for the Study of Higher Education and the American Educational Research Association National Conference. Also joining us today is Dr. Kenyona Walker, a research specialist at the Center on Education and Training for Employment. Dr. Walker is proud to be the first college graduate in her family, a title she exceeded in 2020 when she was conferred her PhD. Her well-received dissertation, At What Cost, provided her and educators with information that uncovered and highlighted the patterns of persistence that Black, urban, first-generation college females experience in their educational journeys, which is highly influenced by race. As a licensed school psychologist, Dr. Walker brings her school-based knowledge to her work, many opportunities to continue to contribute to the understanding of students' experience and the factors that impact their persistence and academic success. She's a lecturer here at OSU, where she teaches urban issues in education and calls upon her personal, academic, and professional experiences to assist graduate students in understanding the complex role of race, policy, and teacher education in the experiences of urban students. She was invited to serve as a panelist at the American Educational Research Association Conference on the topic of translational research, a mechanism for promoting researcher and stakeholder collaboration and the public good. Dr. Walker also serves as co-chair of SEAT's Racial Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Movement Steering Team. So as you can see, we are in incredibly expert hands for this topic today. And I know that I, for one, am really looking forward to hearing their presentation. So I will now turn it over to Dr. Narui and Dr. Walker. All right, well, hi everyone. Um, we are super excited to present this topic. Um, as uh, Dr. Dor mentioned, my name is uh, Dr. Mitsu Narui. I'm the Director of Research at the Crane Center. Um, and really, you know, I just, wanted to say before we get started you know this this idea for this presentation i think for me really came about i think it's hard to sort of ignore the events of recent months and you've and if you follow education you know this the term anti-racist research has been coming up quite a bit um but also really wanted to get some information out there you know we've we've been talking about it talking about it and as someone who firmly believes in social change and so social activism like the next question for army has always been like what do we do about it so how do we move forward with this and so i this um in partnership with dr walker um i think we have hopefully come up with something that will really at least begin to, to get you thinking about the how to um on the research process i mean we have an hour we can't we're not going to be able to teach everything um, but at least get you started to think about it and hopefully also provide some resources for you um going forward because it is and we'll emphasize this throughout it is a process for sure so I'll turn it over to Dr. Walker. Thank you, Dr. Nuari. Um, as they mentioned early, my name is Dr. Kenyana Walker. I am um, feeling very privileged to uh, take part in this event today. Uh, I am a translational research scientist over at uh, SEAT, 
And um, I'm excited to be here, but I'm also a little nervous that the word expert has been throwing around. Um, I just love to engage in uh, practice and collaboration and research that really addresses a multitude of issues, but in particular, um, anything that can elevate and escalate um, kind of uh, issues and remedies for those issues for our most marginalized learners is something I can get behind. So when I was asked to kind of join in, I said, sure, I'm here. So uh, welcome. And I hope you all will find um, a tidbit, a piece, a nugget that you can take from today and uh, use. Um, so before we get started, I think it's important to acknowledge, um, I know we have people from different states, um, I think believe we, maybe even from different countries. Um, so I at least want to acknowledge uh, the land that Dr. Walker and I are on at the moment. Um, so we would like to acknowledge that the land that the Ohio State University occupies is the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, uh, Potawatomi Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwe, and Cherokee peoples. Specifically, the university resides on land ceded in the 1793 Treaty of Greenville and the forced removal of tribes through the Indian Removal Act of 1830. We want to honor the resiliency of these tribal nations and recognize the historical context that has and continues to affect the indigenous people of this land. Okay, um, so as Dr. Dorf mentioned in my introduction, um, I did work in assessment. So as a good assessment person, I never start a presentation without learning outcomes. So uh, to just give you a brief idea of sort of what we're gonna cover through this, um, I wanna start with a very brief definition of anti-racist research. Um, and then going to go through, uh, based on that definition, I think it really fits nicely with um, critical race theory. So I'm going to give very much a 101 broad overview of critical race theory. I mean, there are critical race scholars who make a living um, studying criti critical race theory. So I don't emphasize it's definitely going to be a 101 kind of overview. Um, but then connect the, the what we call CRT with anti-racist research design. And then in the second half, Dr. Walker, um, we'll start to we'll start to sort of make those connections between research anti-racist research design um, and the framework, and then talk about how posi positionality um, will be and about researcher positionality and how to how it addresses it how to address it in research. I think when you think about anti-racist research and anti-racist research design, it's hard to det detach the individual from. Um, from the, from the actual research, right? We bring ourselves to that. So if you noticed um, in Dr. Walker and I's our introductions, we talk about who we are as well, right? So we talk about we bringing, our, bringing ourselves into that research process. So, all right, that being said, okay. So there are a lot of different definitions, I think, of anti-racist research. Um, so in looking around, this is the one that I've kind of felt like was, concisely, I guess, was the best definition in terms of just concisely putting together the concepts. And so when we think about anti-racist research, it's not what is wrong with the people. It's thinking about policy or thinking about social change. And so you, you have to have a framework then by which you're looking at it. So you're not looking at necessarily individual, it's, it's what's causing this to happen, right? And so this, um, the Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research is a, is a very good sort of centralized source. I think if you're kind of looking for that, sort of where do we even begin, right? So this is their definition. So what I propose then is that uh, critical race theory can be that framework by which then you are analyzing those policies. Um, and so what we often refer to as CRT, um, it's for those new to it, it's a framework by which a person can really study racial issues. Um, the history of it really began in the law um, and it tries to address and explain this notion of colorblindness and really tries to disrupt that idea. And so over time, CRT has expanded um, to fields like education. CRT has five basic principles, and I'm going to go through each one of these. 
Um, but the first being that race is, there's a centrality to racism. So you really need to center the research on race and racism. Um, the challenges to neutrality and color blindness, um, with this idea of interest conversions, which I'll talk about, um, counter storytelling, and then the commitment to social justice. So as I mentioned, the first tenet is this um, idea of centrality, um, and centrality to racism. So what, that, what does that mean? It, was, it is this assumption that racism is the, at the heart of bias and discrimination, and that this is an endemic thing. So it's really asking the question of why does this racism exist and how is it structured? So when you're thinking about your research and your research design, recentering it and focusing in on, on that is important. So what role does race have in your research? And how do you center your research questions around race? So again, and that's it's the first tenet for a reason, because that's where you kind of want to start, right? The second is this idea that um, we, we need to challenge neutrality and colorblindness. So I used to, at my previous institution, would, I taught an undergrad course, um, sort of focused on a lot of these concepts. And so, you know, when I would teach my undergrads, you would, we would talk about, you know, students who, who would say, well, I don't see race, right? So that's why this, I have this graphic up. Um, and so we need to challenge that as researchers. And that means that we have to, you have to go into the process with that understanding that impartiality and neutrality do not exist. And it's important to acknowledge that our communities are diverse, particularly when we think about education. Now, I work in an early childhood center. I'm also a higher ed scholar. So if you look at it K through higher ed, it's really important that we acknowledge that diversity within our communities, right? And so, from a research perspective, it's important not to ignore um, race and that it's not, it's important not to center the design around neutrality. What does that mean? It means avoiding the use of deficit language or neutral statements. So what does that mean? <laughs> so, so for example, if you are considered like we in education, the term at risk is often used. You're, not you're really then putting that back to the definition of anti-racist research using the term at risk puts the blame on the person right so you're saying well this you know black students are more at risk for x so you're blaming that on the the black students instead of asking what is the educational system doing that causes black students to not achieve at the same rate right so it's it's trying to avoid that language that places the blame on the person um and so instead, it's really important then to ask that question of like, why, what, is, what are we doing as institutions? Like, how are we failing them? Um, another example that you often see in education literature is uh, around this idea of like resilience or grit, right? So we, we talk about resilience and grit, like, oh, students with more resilience are more successful. Again, you're promoting in many ways that deficit thinking, because again, you're placing the blame on the student instead of, thinking it, thinking about it as what are we doing to those students that are not achieving, right? So, and uh, Dr. Watt, like we'll go through this a little bit more. This is just sort of the theoretical point and then we'll talk about it as sort of how it plays out in the research process. Uh, so, interest conversion. So this is, this, this tenet is that assumption that white people can benefit from racial policy. So it's important to ask like, how do policies and or educational impact practices impact your study? So the common example in higher education is affirmative action. So there have been numerous studies um, that have pointed to the fact that affirmative action, um, often the, the biggest beneficiaries are white women, right? But um, also if you think about what populations are these policies or practices benefiting and in what ways? I mean, I think it's important 
to ask yourself those questions as you're thinking about this from a policy perspective. Another example, maybe you're doing a study and you're at the end or you're doing an evaluation project and at the end you're offering professional like free for professional development with the intent that it would go to schools um, under schools that serve underserved populations and for teachers who maybe can't normally afford the PD. Um, but if you make that PD freely available, then who's actually benefiting it, right? Is it are there teachers from other districts who happen to have the technology that they can access the free be, the free professional development, and then they're accessing that, and the communities that you had intended it for can't actually access it for other reasons, right? So it's important to think about who is actually benefiting from these policies and practices. Um, the next tenant then is this idea of um, counter storytelling. And as someone who myself is trained as a qualitative researcher, this is a very important tenant for me because um, I think, you know, people of color are the authorities to speak about their racialized experience. And so when you think about research design and what ways can you tell that story, if you're not, if you're a quantitative researcher, you can still tell that story, but you need to maybe think outside the box to be able to tell that story. Um, and really, if you are doing counter storytelling, that goes back to the first tenant, then you're, that's your way of centering, uh, centering race, right? So how you structure your, it's important to think about how you structure your research design to focus on those stories for by POC individuals. And then the last tenant, is just more broadly, you know, this idea that we need to be committed to social justice. So we were, I'm a researcher, like we, I got into it for a reason, like we love the research process. But for me as also a, a social change activist, like I want my research to mean something, right? So you really need to go into the process thinking like, how can I use my research to really change that policy and change that system? And so in what ways can your results, um, be disseminated to either policymakers or others in communities. So really thinking about how does this just, I mean, it's great, it goes into a research journal, but then who else is reading that research? How else can we use that process to make sure that people are understanding truly what these, ex these experiences for these students are? And one way to think about that is thinking about then who is on your who is on your research team, right? So interdisciplinary teams, I think, when you think about doing anti-racist research, are really important. It's also really important to think about the diversity of experiences on your research team. So not just racial diversity, but also like you know, as you noticed in our introductions, like first generation status, like college experience, how much your different educational experience. Experiences, thinking about making sure that you have a research team that embraces all those diverse perspectives and that you foster an environment where people feel comfortable bringing those to those to that space. And as Dr. Walker is going to talk about with positionality, it's, it, it goes back to being positioned in our research, right? And understanding that as a research team and research individuals, we're all bringing that positionality into that space. All right, I just did a lot of talking in about 15 minutes. Um, I can, I'm gonna pause for a second to see if there's maybe questions that we can be addressed now or if I should just turn it over to Dr. Walker. I know, oh, I we think we're good. All right. Okay. I'm, all right, I'm gonna go off camera um, or try to here, there we go, and turn Thank it you. over to you. Thank you so much. So um, I just want to kind of um, set the context for the conversation that we're going to have on this part. Um, so we talked a little bit about kind of the theory, and now we're going to talk about kind of the practice. But um, I believe in providing credibility for why someone like myself would be here at an event um, like today. Um, so let me tell you a story. About six years ago, I stood in front of a group of runners um, trying to explain why I needed to stop training them for 5Ks, uh, 10Ks, half marathons, and full marathons because there was something else I needed to pursue. About a year ago, I stood in front of my dissertation committee and defended my dissertation. So I went from a group of about 12 folks, a physician, an attorney, an educator, uh, teaching them kind of uh, 
how to just become a runner than how to be a good runner and, and um, kind of hit their PRs and things. <clears throat> to a smaller committee, uh, the folks that kind of poured into me and kind of shepherded me through um, my dissertating process. And now today, I'm sitting in front of 155 people uh, beginning really to share around why this information is so critically necessary for us to consider as we design programs, interventions, and uh, consider uh, designing research in a more anti-racist way. And for me, I don't see this as a full circle moment. I see this as a looping of one circle and then starting a new one. So I'm very excited to be here with you all. But let me share a little tidbit with you. I graduated from OSU, of course, last year, but that was not my first experience here at OSU. I actually came uh, as an undergraduate, a freshman in 1997. And I came um, from high school having been featured in the Call and Post, which was at that time a predominantly black um, newspaper as someone to watch like up and coming. I went down to the athletic club with my mother to receive uh, an award and also some funding for college. And uh, I, I really was like doing this thing. And I was, I was on the path to becoming the first person in my, my family to achieve um, a college degree. I got to OSU and the wheels fell off. Um, I, I knew that I came with some assets and I knew that I had something, but I also became very keenly aware of the fact that something was missing. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but, I, but something wasn't there for me. So I left. I remember telling my husband, I'm gonna leave before they ask me to leave. So I left, I got married, became a mom and those types of things. I eventually ended up coming back to this university because I felt like I had unfinished business. I had some questions around what happened in, in, with my story, what happened um, in my experience. And so um, thankfully, my second time here, I was able to have faculty and staff who understood, who engaged in and leveraged research in their practice with their students. But also they kind of pushed me towards looking at research that might begin to fill in some of those gaps. So thankfully, as a result of being exposed, exposed to anti-racist research and just researchers that would just acknowledge that racism exists and then use that lens to develop their research. I was able to start designing my own dissertation study, which started off from, let's talk about this. The great thing about uh, that, that study and, and doing that work was my participants did not know that they literally have had breathed air and life into my story. Had I not been exposed to researchers who were engaged in anti-racist research, and had I not decided that I was gonna step out there and do it myself, I probably would not have fully understood exactly where the gaps were in my own educational experience. And I certainly would not be here today to be able to provide you with information uh, because some people are looking at that in particular as it relates to some of our, our black students. So. This is very relevant. This conversation is very relevant. It's very relevant for qualitative researchers. It's very relevant for quantitative researchers. So I hope to, as I said before, drop some nuggets uh, for you today and um, give you some ideas of just practice, uh, designing programs, interventions, and those types of things. Can you advance the slide, please? So when we think about um, considering crafting anti-bias, anti-racist research, we really have to think about our position as, as Mitsu said um, earlier. So if we don't understand our position as researchers, we're likely going to perpetuate those negative narratives that we've heard before about certain students and populations. But if we also don't honor our position, we also might inadvertently strip our participants of any agency any power or any perceived assets that they bring to the research process. And so for this slide, you know, we're just really looking at when we engage in research, when we begin thinking and conceptualizing research, are we an insider and are we an outsider? And why does it matter? Well, an insider is someone that is, that's, has same commonalities as their research participants. For my research, um, I was, had some commonalities, all my, Participants were first gen, they were black, they were women, 
they also are a legitimate member. So those individuals are not going into the community. They're kind of a part of the community. Um, someone who's inside generally has kind of a pulse, better insights of kind of how to approach the process. And my favorite uh, that I learned in qualitative research is uh, sometimes an insider can engage in backyard research. So that is research that is close in proximity. It's research that, that occurs um, on a topic that that person is super familiar with, but also likely had experience. And there are benefits to that. And then when we look at outsiders, for lack of a better term, that's someone that goes into a community and there's nothing wrong with that. But that person might bring some different views than the participants that they're trying to engage. It is possible though, that that person can also bring less bias as it relates to some of the things that those who are part of the community, a researcher like myself, that would be a part of the community. I, I may have some blind spots as well. And I may have some biases that I need to um, address. And so sometimes outsiders are able to gain greater insight because they're on the outside looking in. But the major thing about for researchers like ourselves, if we are outsiders, we gotta check our privilege. And that's why looking at our position before we go into a research project, before we go into um, a project or a program that is aimed at addressing um, issues within the community, we've gotta start looking at what we're bringing to the actual research design and just the research um, process itself. Please advance the next slide. Why is this critical? Well, based on our position, based on our lens, it impacts the way that we would even define the problem. Sometimes, so in our, our, our work at SEAT, we often work in the community, we work uh, with agencies, we work within um, OSU, we, we engage in a lot of different community kind of conversations and, and collaborative problem solving. Oftentimes we are brought an issue. Most, someone will say, this is the issue we're trying to solve for. But sometimes we have to work and collaborate with our partners to try and reshape kind of what the issue really, really is because they're bringing a lens to the issue, we're bringing a lens to the issue. Um, and so it, it really impacts kind of what we say the problem is. Our position also impacts how we believe where the, where the problem exists, who it exists with. Uh, Mitzi mentioned that earlier. And so sometimes we'll say, I, I like her example. Um, but another example I like to use is like hard to reach families. Um, so one way we can use our position to reframe that word would be to consider thinking, these are the families that we are having difficulty uh, reaching. Our position also tells us, and I think this is critically important, if we are doing this work with a population, if we're doing it for them, if we're doing it to them, or if we're doing it on their behalf, because that makes a really, really big difference. But in general, our position shapes what we write in our discussion sessions of our sections of our research, how we write the implications and how we articulate that, but also how we disseminate the results of our work. Our position impacts every part of the process um, engaging in research. Please advance the slide. So I'm offering a suggestion that we look at the critical race lens, but that we also just consider the whole concept of, of intersectionality. So we know that intersectionality essentially will look at any of the minoritized identities that our populations um, have. And it, it, it addresses, it acknowledges, and it honors all the historical discrimination and things that have, that have occurred. It's critically necessary that we do that. The uh, state of Ohio recently released their whole child framework. And what I like about the framework is it considers all the experiences that our children have in schools. And so it tries to um, create interventions and, and work to address all of the experiences the child may have, but also all the experiences that their parents may have had or all the experiences that are around in their community. Intersectionality is very, very similar. It just simply says, what are the identities that our participants bring to this? And what do those identities mean in terms of race? Um, Maury Patton Davis, um, here at OSU mentioned a quote, I will not do it justice. And I don't know who said it, but she often has said, when we address those who are at the bottom, so we think about a funnel or we think about kind of a pit, when we address the issues of the folks at the bottom, 
we then address the issues of anyone that's above them. So we think about intersectionality. We think about the folks, the folks that as a result of racism, as a result of discrimination have been placed at the bottom. Then when we start crafting research interventions and programs to address their specific needs, because there's intersecting identities, then we will begin to address the needs of most of the individuals that are above them. That's why it's very critical that we consider all of those different identities. Um, and so we cannot underestimate how helpful it would be to consider this as we're crafting a proposal for a research project or considering writing up the research protocol or design. It is critically necessary that we look through all of those lenses. Please advance the slide. So at SEAT, we engage, as I mentioned before, we engage with a lot of community partners, different agencies uh, within the state and, and outside. And we use, of course, like a problem solving model. This is kind of what we do. But as I said before, we will have an agency come to us and say, we want to address this issue. We will then take kind of our knowledge, our expertise, engage in this, this collaboration and really start having some conversations about where is race? So we'll start back at this problem solving circle initially with what's the role of race in this? Where, we know it's there. What's the role of race in this? And how can we then start kind of looking at the problem definition in a different way? How can we set goals? Because sometimes some of our goals and our interventions and our programs aren't quite getting at the, at the issue, at the, at the, as the crux of the issue. So um, we apply this model and we pair it uh, with our knowledge around kind of race and education. And then we start really drilling down so that any program that we design is going to be the most effective, but it's also gonna honor the, experience of, the experiences of everyone, including those who are marginalized. Advance the slides, please. So if we, as researchers, if we are not seeing, sensing, hearing, attending to, responding to, feeling race, we are doing a tremendous disservice to ourselves, our participants, and society. And I'll tell you why. We all have heard and have seen this racial awakening that has occurred in our country. We've seen, you know, um, different events happening at our university and, and our jobs and in, you know, different agency levels. But what we know about, about educational research is this, that any student that we encounter from the crib to a student walking out with um, a master's or a doctorate or a associate's degree, we know that race, this is from research, we know that race has impacted educational practices, teacher practices. We know that race um, impacts the amount of trust that a student has with their teacher or the amount of trust that a teacher has with their students. We know that race impacts student motivation. It impacts the way that students are disciplined. It impacts our students' perception of school climate. It impacts a student's academic engagement and impacts their social integration. It impacts uh, the way that teachers believe what their students can do. It impacts teachers' perceptions. It impacts the selection and implementation of curriculum. And in particular, for some of our most minoritized students, it impacts their ability to be acknowledged and placed in gifted and talented programs, and even the way that that curriculum is implemented. And it also impacts uh, who is referred for special education, how they're identified, if they're identified, and if they receive services. So if we are doing any type of research, all of those different things that I just mentioned have impacted the people and the participants that you are doing research with. And they don't have to be K-12 students. If we're doing research with college students, if we're doing research with post-grads, we know that those early and lifelong experiences have impacted their outcomes, their persistence, their resilience, their assets. So, it, it is a great disservice when we don't acknowledge that race has played a role in the pretty much the whole life cycle. Advance the slides, please. So this is where we get to where you say, well, I came here to figure out how I'm gonna do this. How do we do it? Well, the first thing that we have to do is use literature as our guide. 
I don't know how many of you were trained, but I was trained to do an extensive uh, systematic review of literature when I'm looking at designing a program or designing an intervention or designing uh, a research project. But I would like us to consider looking at reviewing the literature a little bit differently. For those of us who may not have been engaged in research that has really kind of acknowledged or uh, really addressed the role of race, we might want to broaden our scope when we look at literature. And what do I mean by that? Well, we all know we have our go-to folks. You know, if we're, if we're studying a certain thing, we have our go-to people that we're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna get this article, this article, this, this article. We have journals that we'll go to. But there are journals that publish around student experiences that are specific to minoritized communities. So if you are doing an intervention, a research project or a, a program that impacts all students, I would suggest that you start looking broadly at the journals where those publications are held that you pull your, your literature from. Because we know that interventions sometimes are different when, it, when it's with different populations and it's based on race. We know that some things happen differently uh, based on race. And so we also know that we have scholars, black scholars, white scholars, whatever scholars who, who look at race. And a lot of times those journals that we're not looking at, the Journal of Negro Education, holds a lot of information for us as researchers that we can pull into our research design. We need to revisit our position constantly, constantly in the process, constantly in the process. As someone that engaged in research with first generation uh, urban black females, even though I consider myself an insider, I wasn't quite as inside as I would have been if I had been in, you know, in that population 10 years ago. So I was constantly kind of checking my position to make sure that, that I wasn't even using some of, some of my privilege as someone that had graduated and someone that was in a, a different SES position. I was constantly making sure that I was not bringing in any bias or any other things that was going to spoil my ability to really use the information that they were providing me. We've got to continue reviewing those intersections of identities. What, what are the identities that are intersecting that typically causes our students or our participants to experience uh, multiple or compounding uh, difficulties, discrimination, and those types of things? Really consider if you are a um, non-person of color, a, a, a non-Black researcher, really consider the idea of um, pairing up with um, a researcher of color or a black researcher who we call are like um, culture brokers. Um, culture brokers have been used in medicine, they've been used in education. They're simply individuals that are part of the community who can be the link from um, the person wanting to come into the community and providing a program. We, we're seeing this now with the vaccine. They can be a link from that person, that community, really to the individuals who wanna do the work. And I would suggest um, we have wonderful individuals here at OSU who consistently engage in this work. And they can be great culture brokers, but not only can they be a culture broker, some of them are busy, but they can also lead you to other ones. So we have scholars like um, Dr. Antoinette Miranda, Dr. Scott Graves, Dr. Keisha Radliff, uh, Lori Patton Davis. Um, we have Noelle Arnold and Camille Quinn, Eddie Fletcher, Donna Ford, Nicole Luthi, we have all of these different uh, black researchers here at this university that focus a lot of their research on education and race. And they are just immediate models that you can tap into of a culture broker. Five, we need to make sure that we rescind the work. Sometimes we start out here and then when we start including race and all those different things, we can get that center right on the population and all of their different experiences. I suggest that we radically, unashamedly address the fact that racism exists. It has existed in education. It has impacted all of our students, black and white. It has created a power imbalance. And so when we are wanting to do research in student populations, we have to radically address that in it, in the research design and all those different things. Then we have to address the power that's associated with it. And then next we'll have to address the privilege. 
So if we're addressing the privilege, we're addressing those who have been disadvantaged in the ways that they have been disadvantaged. And then lastly, really reframing the discourse, uh, as Mitsu mentioned earlier, around um, kind of experiences of students and those types of things. Next slide, please. So then um, people will say, well, this is great. This takes a lot of work, right? The most effective way that we can design anti-racist research is to be an anti-racist person ourselves moving towards that. So if we think about the, the, um, the race walkway, I don't know if you all have heard that analogy where you, know, you have folks that are, that are kind of just racist and, and they're not gonna move from that station. They're just actively engaged. You have folks that are on that walkway and they're, it's rolling toward racism, but they're just standing still. So they're not going away from it, but they're not advancing you know, uh, very quickly. Then you have folks who have decided, you know what, I'm gonna turn around, but they're not going like super, super fast, but they are turning away from it. And then you have folks who have really moved into this anti-racist position because they are running away from it and trying to be a part of uh, crafting a solution and crafting uh, remedies as a result of being exposed to all of this, this stuff. That is the position that we need to be taking as researchers. We need to be considering ourselves an ally in all of this work that we are doing and how do we how do we engage in this work what actions does the ally do we need to consider ourselves an accomplice and we need to consider what type of actions does an accomplice engage in and then we need to consider ourselves a co-conspirator someone that's going to get into the mix they're going to take the risk and they're going to ensure that they are doing their role in whatever they're doing. So if it's research, they're gonna do their role as a co-conspirator to ensure that they're not gonna be an instrument of racism, but they're going to address it and they're going to address it in their research and they're going to address it in their presentations of their research and they're going to really um, handle it. And um, there's gonna be a takeaway uh, in the chat for you on that as well. Um, and so, thank you, Melissa. And so it looks like I have a question, but if you can advance the last, the next slide, please. If you'd like to find out more what, what we're doing at um, our center, uh, I love that we, that we got to collaborate with the Crane Center. And so I would love for you all to take kind of a, uh, a peek at what we're doing in our center, particularly as it, as it relates to um, kind of racial equity, diversity, and inclusion. Please feel free to scan that bar. Um, you'll get to see all about the wonderful programs we also have in our center and just the work that we're doing in this area. Um, I'm gonna stop there because it looks like there are some questions. There are, so, and there's some really good questions. So um, if it's okay, I think I'm gonna just kind of, that we've got some upvotes here. So I'm gonna kind of start at the beginning and um, we'll maybe you and I could just go back and forth and give our takes. I think I'm looking at these, I've been looking of these questions and coming back to the fact that um you know this i'm gonna stop sharing here I don't have to, um you know these uh when we th when we talk about these issues the answers are messy i don't think there's a clear like right or wrong to any of this um so uh but the first question you know how do uh, white researchers balance the need for cultural brokers by not wanting to overburden um, people of color researcher fantastic question um appreciate very much first of all asking even asking the question um you know i think and i'll just speak for myself to say you know i think i i greatly appreciate people white researchers wanting to do the self-work that we've kind of both been alluding to um i think you it you know being humble and real like coming into the experience just realizing that you don't know everything and that it is not my sole job to help you teach everything so you just have to continue that self-work so coming going to a a, a a person of color researcher you know you don't go in with the expectation that they are somehow going to quote unquote fix or make it better for you like you still need to continue that work the work challenging your own privileges and i say that's anyone with privileges can be a messy disruptive experience and so i think you have to go in understanding that what you might be hearing from that person, you may not want to hear, or it may challenge your own privileges. Um, that you have to be willing to sort of go there. And speaking for myself, like if I'm working with someone who is willing to do their, that own self-work, do their own anti-racist anti -racist work on themselves, I think that's you, you have to approach that from that perspective. Feel free to add. 
Okay. Yes, and then also, as I mentioned earlier, so <clears throat> if we think about the concept of culture brokers, there's different levels of kind of um, aligning yourself with them. So for example, you might just say, hey, I wanna make sure that I've designed this, this research project to uh, attend a race, to kind of honor you know, um, the past, but also um, just to ensure that I've kind of got things right and didn't miss any literature. Sometimes a culture broker may be willing just to look at that for you. Maybe not necessarily uh, be involved in, in designing, co-designing or uh, be a co-I or um, collaborate with you, but they might be willing to say, yeah, I'll take a peek at it. Other ones might be able to you know, shoot a couple articles your way and say, hey, you should probably read this. You should probably read this, those, type, those types of things. I think there is a tension, uh, particularly as it relates to, to race more recently, because you do have kind of the whole idea um, um, that we talk about kind of the, the black tax, um, where you have individuals of color that are being tapped all the time to engage in um, activities just because, you know, who, who are you, who are you going to get? Those, those individuals seem like experts and many times they are, but um, their time is limited. And so you can, you know, re the individuals I mentioned, um, none of them are going to say yes. <laughs> I endorse this, but we have researchers at this university that has been doing these types of research designs for years. Um, simply asking them to shoot you in a, the right direction could be helpful as a white person wanting to engage in this research. That might be their level of being a culture broker, but there are certainly others out there. Um, and that's why I think looking at literature is very helpful. Because if we look at literature, we can see the interventions that have been used, particularly for minoritized people. We can see the way that the research has been constructed. We can see the way that the words and the interview protocol have been constructed to honor race. Where we may not necessarily have to directly um, go to a culture broker, but we can go to their literature. I hope that answers the question. All right, uh, next question. What words can be replaced concepts such as achievement gap and at risk for learning difficulties? <laughs> Do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? I'll let you go first on that. Okay, um, opportunity gap perhaps. So again, it's this idea of reframing it from the individual, right? So an achievement gap implies that somehow black children achieve less than white children, right? So instead of saying it, put it, Entering it on the it's the opportunity gap. So what opportunities is it that the black kids don't have that the white kids have, right? Instead of at and then and there's it kind of relates to the next question about at risk. I think when we think about this term at risk, um, you get in your sort of it's this, so we centering it away from that that person. It doesn't instill pride in someone to be called at risk, right? So are they historically underserved? Are they being placed at risk, right? So they're not, the individual isn't at risk, but the system is placing them at risk. Um, I think it's important to sort of think about, again, thinking, of a, thinking about it from a systemic perspective. Um, that about my two cents, <laughs> didn't want to add anything. Yeah, so I, I would consider kind of re reframing our concept of um, how these, how these students become at risk. Um, so we think about the educational experience and I'm sure the, uh, the, the Crane Center has resources around this, um, is probably aware of this, but when we think about our students, um, our earliest learners, so our preschool learners and those types of, of kiddos, we also have to have a conversation about um, capital and what capital does and does not do. When our students have access to certain types of capital very early on, before they even hit formalized education, what that does. So we talk about at risk, we talk about gaps, and I love the whole idea around opportunities, but the reality is this. When we have students who have access to certain types of, of books, when we have students, kiddos, I should say, who have access to certain type of culture building things very, very early on as a result of kind of redlining and different things, that conversation looks different than talking about at-risk students. We're really talking about the fact that many of these kiddos have started their life without many of these opportunities that some of our other students begin with. Um, so really the conversation is about what capital have they been exposed to early or what capital have they not been exposed to? What enriching activities are available to them? And, and really stepping back away from that because sometimes 
our at-risk students just need exposure to additional capital. Um, so that answer your question, but you know, we, we do have to be careful, um, you know, at risk of failing, at risk of not advancing, those types of things. And that's, you know, that can describe some of our students' experiences. Um, but I, I do like the idea of thinking about kind of how opportunities have been um, awarded or, or leveraged. Yeah, it really goes back to this idea of like if it, the common theme of like, again, thinking about the, the, the system, right? Looking at it from a systemic systemic lens um, becomes really important. So um, next question, I talked a little already about the at risk. Um, I noticed you're using the faith, faith yeah, the phrase people of color, but doesn't that have subtle undertones as well? Um, for example, a child of mixed race with milky skin should be part of the equity conversations um, and just wanting some clar clar clarification. Um, yes, it's a messy, messy concept. <laughs> do you want do you want to take a first stab or you want, I, I don't I don't know if I have a great answer because I've had conversations with colleagues about um, people, I realized when I was doing my slides, I used people of color and then I used by POC. So I think this has been an ongoing conversation for at least for my community for a while. Um, and so I, it's, it, yeah, the, the, the communities I engage with as an Asian American researcher, um, I think it's a conversation that's, that's, it's kind of messy itself. So that I'm, I'm not really sure I could offer a good answer. Um, but recently, like I said, you've seen the, the term by POC, which for folks who don't know, Black, Indigenous, people of color. Um, being used a lot more um, because of this kind of issue, I think, but feel free to add. Um. Yeah, so this is strictly my personal opinion. No one's endorsing this but me. <laughs> um, so people of color, um, Black people, African Americans, those types of, of terms that we use. Uh, personally for me, and I, I, I find this a lot um, within my community, is that sometimes um, there's a tension there because I personally would pre prefer to be identified just simply as someone that is black. I, I, don't, I don't want to be put in kind of a, a people of color um, category. That's just my personal opinion I, based on my experiences and, and, and the fact that even within kind of the bucket of people of color, there, there tends to still be some privilege. Um, so for me personally, that's the way that I describe myself. And I, I tend for myself to tend to stay away from using that. Um, but then you have other individuals who fall into that bucket that that believe that 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 title best honors their position and their opinion. Um, I think that might be more of a, of a personal preference. Um, it's not something that that I use in my research, but I think that also just comes from the fact that I have a very strong preference for the way that I describe myself. I think if you ask around, you get different responses from different people, for sure, which is why I think it's it's a great question. I just don't think there's a real clear, um, concrete answer to it. So um, anyway, OK, next question. Um, how Has CRT been applied to disciplines in psychology? If not, how do we start this conversation? Personally, I don't know the answer to the first part of that question. Um, I don't know if you do at all. The, if it's been applied in psychology, I'm not. So um, I'll just say, and folks in psychology will just either be excited I say this or not, but psychology is a very, very broad field. As I mentioned before, I'm a school psychologist. Um, I know a lot of um, psychologists who use critical race theory in their research. Um, tons of them kind of design their research around it. I've read tons of articles where um, it's used just kind of in that, in that field. Um, to describe kind of student experiences and those types of things. Um, can I, I'm gonna look at this other question. So is it possible, it possible to be fully an insider researcher when, when completing critical intersectionality, if we're not all things, but a lot of things? Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, um, and Mitzi, you might have a different opinion. As I mentioned earlier, when I designed my dissertation, um, I designed it knowing this. At one point, my intersections matched my population. That being that they were urban, first generation. So urban, um, we used in place of, of uh, low income. So urban, first generation, black uh, women, um, undergraduate students. Those identities and intersections I shared at one point, um, of course, in my life. 
But when I was engaging with those uh, participants, at that point, I was middle class, but I was also had already had two college degrees. And so, as I mentioned earlier, while I was an insider, I was an insider, a full insider at one point, but when I started doing my research, I was not a full insider. And so that's why I talked about kind of checking your position constantly, because there were times that I would leave from, from engaging with my participants, doing interviews and focus groups that I would have to really process what, what their conversation looked like to me now. First of all, I was much older than they were too, but what their conversation looked like to me now, how I was analyzing their conversation through the filter of being all those different um, intersecting identities that I was now versus you know, um, the intersecting Id identities that I carried uh, before I completed my degree and my SES change. So I hope yeah. that answers your question. Yeah, I also, um, for myself doing my dissertation many, many moons ago, um, but uh, I studied Asian American LGB students, um, but so obviously I identify as Asian American, Asian, I'm sorry, Asian and Asian American LGBT students, but um, identify as a member of the Asian American community, but actually do not identify as a member of the LGBT community. And so um, I'm sort of the classic like insider outsider. Um, and you better believe my participants questioned my outsider status um, based on my sexual identity. And so, um, you know, I think you it's that's where that constant check of your um, positionality is important. Um, you know, I was at the time probably closer to the age of my participants. I was studying college students, um, but at the same time, I was, you know, I was a. I also had two degrees, and and again, not member of um, the LGBT community. And so, you know, you have to just. It's a. It's a constant thing, and it to to have to you need just need to articulate that and constantly keep that in check. Um, I think is important. And then um, real quickly back to the question about the disciplines of psychology to so start. I still think you could start this conversation. I think um, even with education and it's a different, I was talking with a colleague about another theory um, that's out there and I've been higher ed and she's a, a TNL person. The theory that I was talking about like completely resonated. It's, we use it quite often in higher ed, completely resonated with her, but she had never seen it really in her TNL literature. So I would encourage you to also start the conversation. So if you're in a particular part of psychology where you are not seeing a lot of CRT research, start the conversation. Theoretical papers and applying these concepts. So those five tenets that I went to, um, that I spoke about at the beginning, but I would encourage you to that conversation if you're a particular aspect of psychology or you're not finding that since it is such a large field. Um, so uh, yeah, so anyway, okay, we have like one minute and like two more questions that popped up. So I'm not sure, um, wanna acknowledge people's time. So real quickly, just wanna say thank you, but um, I can, I, we can stay on and certainly answer some of these questions um, as well. Um, let me see here. Based on the idea that we should frame, be framed around policy, does it align with an anti-racist research agenda to design interventions for students? For example, an intervention designed to improve students' writing skills. Do you wanna go, do you want me to go? I'm still reading the question, sorry. Okay. <laughs> So my first reaction to that is, um, well, yes, you, you certainly want to still design interventions for students, but when you're then looking at the data, I think keeping, keeping that anti-racist perspective in mind is important. That's my initial reaction. Again, there's just a bunch of questions that popped up all of a sudden, so I'm still trying to process that myself, but feel free to add on. Yeah, so if we're, if we're thinking about um, designing an intervention to, to address writing skills, I think that's what the question is about, yeah. and then policy. So we know we have all this policy surrounding different things that students have to be able to do at different you know, time points in the educational journey. But then we also have kind of you know, things that, that can, we can do to get us there. So that's where the intervention comes into play. So when we're thinking about writing, uh, we're also thinking about literacy. We're, we're thinking about fine motor, but, but we're really thinking about the words and how students form those words and they make sentences and the sentence makes meanings and those types of things. Um, and so on the face of it, it might seem like this is not something we should be, you know, thinking about anti-racist design, but it very much should be. Um, when we think about our students in our schools, we have to think about, again, different things they were exposed to as a result of their race, different um, opportunities, different 
uh, experiences. Some of our students have parents who have access that they can do these interventions themselves. Um, so when we start thinking about our students that are the most um, marginalized, again, about that well, if we craft our research, craft our intervention, craft our program or our project around the experiences of our most marginalized students, we are going to capture the rest of the students. We're gonna get most of them, unless they have like a, like a disability or something. Um, we're probably gonna catch all the rest of those students whose, whose um, identities uh, are on top of the um, minoritized students. So I hope that answers your question. I managed to clean up the Q and A a little bit to make it easier to find the questions. So, um, is it actually possible for non-minoritized researchers to ethically do research specifically on the experiences of mi minoritized children and family families? Um, are there types of research that may be more appropriate for non-minoritized researchers to engage in? My initial reaction is, I think it goes back to that self-work. I don't know if there's a if there's a truly a quote unquote appropriate research. I think if you have an interest, a genuine interest in it and I'm willing to do the self work and really look at it broadly and, and also bring in folks um, to to help you on that process. Um, I think I don't necessarily think there would be an inappropriate way to do it, but feel free to add. So we actually have um some researchers that I'm aware of at, at, at OSU and then more broadly um, that are white that engage that engage in, in research um, with marginalized um, students and, and youth and things. I think absolutely we want to have other individuals addressing the issues relating to race regardless of um, their racial background. But again, we have to make sure that the lens that we bring to that work has almost been clean. So sometimes, you know, we think about anti-racist positions and, and kind of our experiences and how that, how we, how that provides a filter for us. Um, I think for non-Black or non-people of color um, researchers, we have to make sure that our lens is accurate. So definitely we should be having all types of individuals engaging in this type of research but we have to make sure that our, our lens that we're looking through is accurate, um, that, it's, that it's responsive, but most importantly, that it does justice. And that, I mean, for me, that's what research really does, particularly when you're looking at kind of crafting it to be anti-racist is that it can be used as an instrument of justice and liberation, quite frankly. All right, we have one more question. Um, I will say that we'll probably make this the last question, but if you have any additional questions, um, please feel free to contact us. Um, I think we're happy to answer. Um, and hopefully this has been informative and helpful. So um, last question, when designing research using intersectionality, how do we interpret findings? Um, was it race, was it gender, or the status, et cetera? All of the above. <laughs> um, intersection, and, and I think um, the, um, was to say uh, Kimberly Kenshaw was one of the quotes on the slides, um, I think is a very good starting point. So I think, you know, well, I started this presentation saying this was meant to be a very broad 101 introductory introduction to some of these concepts. So when you're thinking about designing research using intersectionality, going back to one of Dr. Walker's points, doing the literature review, doing the research, learning more about intersectionality, and you will find that I think it's interpreting the findings is it, it is all of the above, right? It's the positionality. It's um, it, it's your positionality. It's the findings. It's all of these things kind of put together. That's my 30 second interpretation. Feel free to add. Yeah. Yes, I agree. I so in my research, um, I had one participant who was actually an engineering student. And so even though I didn't have enough data, um, she was the only engineering student I had, even though I didn't have enough data, I, I needed to have some type of brief conversation about the fact that her experience was slightly different than the rest of my um, my participants because she was in a, a male dominated, white dominated kind of field. And so we needed to have a, at least a little brief conversation about the fact that even her experience was slightly different than the rest of the, um, the participants in my study. All right. Well, that, that was it. <laughs> so um, thank you all for joining us. I don't add anything. I just, hopefully this was, this was informative. So, all right.